Do you have exams coming up and you can't seem to get the motivation to actually do some work? You know you've got a lot to study and you're a really ambitious person, but something's not quite clicking. Well, in this video, I have some mindsets and practical protocols which you can implement to optimize your motivation and perform the best you can for your upcoming exams. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Rohan. I'm a fifth year medical student studying at the University of Cambridge. Let's consider the times that we may feel amotivated and how we can bounce out of that to get into our work. We'll start with mindset like we did in the previous video when we were discussing about stress. For mindset, it's important to have some goal which you can look to as a source of your motivation. There was this movement in the productivity world a few years ago saying that goals are overrated and motivation doesn't matter and the only thing that does matter is enjoying the process and also discipline. But I think people like Ali Abdal, who was a big proponent of this concept, have come around to acknowledge the importance of goals. Goals set us in a direction for us to travel on, which clarify what the immediate next steps we need to take are, particularly if the goals are specific and they are wisely set. So for example, if we take sport like running, if I want to run a sub 90 minute half marathon, which actually is a personal goal of mine. That will help me decide what training schedule I need to follow, what exercises I need to do and what I need to eat, which might be very different from say, training for a marathon. And in my experience, the need for motivation kicks in when I'm the worst version of myself. And this is usually after dinner when I'm tired and I really don't want to study. When I'm in that state, I need something to compel me to get out of the lull and re-engage with my studies. That's where my goal of wanting to do well in the exam comes in, which reminds me that although it's uncomfortable in the moment, the reward of doing well will outweigh the immediate pleasure of say mindlessly watching YouTube. However, for this to be effective, you need to have a strong why behind your goal. Why are we putting ourselves through hours and hours of hard toil for the exams or whatever your goal is? The data suggests that your why needs to be something bigger than yourself. If we do things only for selfish reasons, you can only go so far. But if we do things to help or honor others, your motivation will be so much stronger. So for me, the main motivation to study is not principally for myself, although don't get me wrong, I do want to aim for awards and stuff, but it's primarily to honor God and secondly, to honor my parents. I want to honor God because I'm a Christian, so I believe he's placed me as a medical student at Cambridge for a reason. So I want to work hard to make the most of the resources and opportunities that he's given me. I also want to honor my parents because they work super hard to set up a life for me in the UK and have sacrificed so much for me and my brother. For you, if you're studying medicine, perhaps your motivation might come from wanting to become the best doctor you can be so you can help your future patients get the best possible care. Or even if you're doing something like economics, you can turn that and derive motivation from wanting to be the best economist you can be to help devise a monetary policy or models to help address poverty or even create wealth for yourself, which then you can use to donate to charitable causes which you actually care about. Having a reason why you want to give something your all rather than just settling for the path of least resistance is critical. As Viktor Frankl, a psychiatrist and survivor of the Holocaust once said, he who has a why can bear almost any hell. And excitingly, there's actually evidence to back this up. A study by David Yeager and colleagues in 2014 took two groups of teenagers studying maths. To one group, they motivated the kids by using self-transcendent purposes. So this means by getting them to engage with maths problems in order to acquire skills so that, for example, they can have a positive impact on the world. To the control group, they motivated them with self-orientated material. So for example, they'd say, uh, you want to acquire skills so that you can access higher paying jobs. And what they found was those who focused on purposes bigger than themselves had a lower tendency to procrastinate on their work and actually achieved deeper learning and scored better on the tests. And I think this is a pretty compelling case to place your motivation outside of factors purely for your own personal benefit. As a side point, I mentioned my parents and I quickly want to address the issue of the expectations parents might place on their kids. In particular, parents from the Asian community have a reputation of having high academic expectations for their children. For the record, I'm not saying that my parents have ever placed any burdensome expectation on me, but I know some parents can be like that. In my opinion, these expectations actually come from a place of love. Our parents just want the best for us and they want to make sure that we make the best use of all the opportunities that life has given us. They just may express this love in a different way to people from other cultures. As long as you can show that you're putting in all the effort that you can, I don't think your parents can be unhappy. And if you are experiencing like unduly expectation and pressure from your parents, I definitely think it's worth talking to them about it. And finally, to have the ultimate motivated mindset, the holy grail of motivation is when hard work itself becomes the reward. Andrew Huberman explains how you can do this beautifully in the following clip. In those moments of the most intense friction, you tell yourself, 
this is very painful and because it's painful, it will evoke an increase in dopamine release later, meaning it will increase my baseline in dopamine. But you also have to tell yourself that in that moment, you are doing it by choice and you're doing it because you love it. And I know that sounds like lying to yourself. And in some ways it is lying to yourself, but it's lying to yourself in the context of a truth, which is that you want it to feel better. You want it to feel even pleasureful. I love this. And the reason why it works is that the prefrontal cortex, i.e. the thinking part of your brain, is linked to the reward pathways in the brain. So you can program yourself to find joy even in strenuous or hard work. You notice that Huberman also made reference to dopamine. Dopamine is a neuromodulator involved in motivation and it complements your sympathetic nervous system because dopamine is a precursor molecule and is actually converted into adrenaline. I covered the sympathetic nervous system in the last video on stress, so go watch that after this. But just to recap and add a little more, our level of stress depends on the balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system activity. So the sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight system, which biases us towards action, and the parasympathetic nervous system is our rest and digest system. And science has shown that performance relates to our level of arousal or alertness in this inverted U-shaped curve. So basically you just want the right level of stress in the system to do our best work. Okay, so a quick crash course on dopamine is needed to make the most of our motivation because it's complicated and it's often misunderstood. Dopamine is often thought of as a pleasure molecule as it's associated with the term dopamine hits, where we basically get this burst of release of dopamine during hedonistic activities like video games, sex, and junk food. And it's true that dopamine increases when these things are done. However, it would be more accurate to say that dopamine release is more in anticipation of these things and the actual acquisition of these things is a more complex milieu of neurotransmitters, one of which is dopamine. The pattern of dopamine release is also different. Usually we have some baseline level of dopamine transmission between our neurons, and this corresponds to our general motivation and drive towards our goals. When we engage in highly rewarding, palatable, or addictive behaviors, there's a peak in dopamine activity in the reward circuits of the brain, corresponding to that euphoric feeling. But this is short-lived, and immediately after your dopamine levels fall to a trough, and it takes a while for your dopamine levels to come back to baseline. And the baseline which your dopamine levels return to is actually lower than your previous dopamine baseline. So why did I just take a few minutes of your life to explain this? Well, it's because we can learn a few important things from this. First, if we want to stay focused on our work, we need to avoid hyper-stimulating activities like pornography or excessive social media use. This is because they actually lower our baseline dopamine, leading us into a dopamine trough and lower levels of motivation. Second is by increasing our baseline level of dopamine, we'll have a greater level of motivation to engage in our studies. So the million dollar question is, how can we increase our baseline level of dopamine, which will help pull us out of any a motivated state into the optimum level for stress and performance? The things you can do in real time to increase dopamine and therefore motivation more broadly involve leaning into small stresses, which links to what we were discussing earlier about the holy grail of motivation being to find joy in hard effort. For example, cold showers are something that I've been doing for several years now, and that's been shown to have long lasting increases in dopamine several hours after the initial exposure. Caffeine consumption can also produce lasting increases in dopamine, but you need to be careful as this can interfere with sleep. And some people are actually very sensitive to caffeine, so it pushes them too far right to the stress performance curve, which means they're not able to focus on their work and they said become very jittery and can't really settle down to focus. Andrew Huberman is also a big advocate in getting morning light exposure because apparently that low solar angle of light activates certain cells in our retina, which increases our baseline dopamine. Diet, sleep, and exercise also increases our baseline dopamine. And I really like exercise on this front because it biases us towards action. So physical movement can make us more likely to move cognitively. It's basically like Newton's first law of motion. So often, if I'm tired in the afternoon, I like to go to the gym or go on a run to re-energize myself as exercise releases adrenaline. It's also been shown via this increase in adrenaline that after a bout of studying, it can promote memory retention. So it's a double win. 
Engaging in hard things like exercise or cold showers also helps inoculate us against stress as it increases our resilience. So if we can deal with these smaller stresses, we are more likely to be able to deal with the bigger stress of studying for exams. There are so many more tools which you can use to modulate your dopamine levels to increase alertness and your motivation to study. But I'll leave it here for now as I've been talking long enough. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you do find this video useful. Please watch my previous video where we talk about how to find the optimum stress level when you're facing up for exams. I also have another video I'll bring somewhere up on screen where I talk about how to deal with a high content load to study for exams, which I'm sure many of us are facing right now, including me. But anyway, take care. I wish you all the best for your exams and bye for now.